Matthew chapter 21, and this week we're going to continue our study uh, in parables. Uh, Jesus taught many parables, and uh, this, is, this was His favorite way to teach. Here's Jesus, God in the flesh. And let me say again, Jesus is God. He's Amen. God in the flesh, Amen. and uh, He taught with simple stories. We should learn from the master teacher. If we need to teach some things, we all need to be teachers, by the way. If you're a parent, you ought to be a teacher. Uh, if you're a grandparent, you ought to be a teacher. If you're a, a Christian, you ought to be a teacher. Uh, we ought to be teaching somebody what God has given to us, what somebody has given to us. Now, it's spiritual things, but it's it's practical, everyday life things, too. Right. Uh, moms teach your daughters how to cook, and how to clean, and how to sew, or whatever you know. Whatever's been handed to you, teach it to them. I'd say, Dad, teach your kids how to cook, but I, I'm not real good at that, so... The way I teach my kids to cook is call it Pizza Hut. That's how they learn from me. Uh, but, but teach whatever you know. If you know how to mow a lawn. We, we take that stuff for granted. We really do. So things like starting a mower, starting a weed eater. We take that for granted that we just know that stuff. But we ought to teach whatever we have to someone else around us. And by the way, you'll, you'll find real fulfillment in life. You really will. When you learn to take whatever's been handed to you and hand it to somebody else. That's really what soul winning is. Soul winning is taking what's been handed to you and it's handing it to someone else. And you'll just find great joy in that. But Jesus, when He taught, He used parables. He used simple stories to relay important truth. Again, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's an earthly story used to illustrate some important truth. And this week, we're going to look at the parable of the two sons. The parable of the two sons. Next week, we're going to continue in the same uh, the same portion of Scripture with another parable. The, por the parable of the two sons, let me give a little bit of the background. In fact, if you would, look back in verse uh, 23, please. Verse 23, if you start right here in Matthew 21 and you go all the way through Matthew 22, what you're going to find are the religious leaders trying to trip up Jesus. They're asking him questions. They're, they're trying, they're attempting to make him look foolish. They're attempting to make him look silly. And so you're going to find all the way from this point, all the way through Matthew 22, that they're trying, attempting to make Jesus look silly, asking him questions, trying to trip him up, trying to trick him. And what I love is if you go to the very end of chapter 22, uh, look at the last verse. After all these questions, these attempts, verse 46 says, And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. And uh, they, they couldn't trip Jesus up. He's God in the yeah. flesh. He's all wisdom. He's all knowledge. And uh, by the way, the day will come when all the voices that speak against God, they'll all be silenced. Amen. And God will be asking them the questions. God, they'll be standing before the Lord. And Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. And here you have the religious leaders, the religious uh, 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 upper crust of the day. They're trying to trip up Jesus. They're asking Him some things. They begin in verse 23, Matthew 21. The Bible says that when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Now, it wasn't so much wrong that they asked this question because these men were the, the authority of their society. So there was nothing wrong with them asking this question the question itself was an honest question, but the way they asked it, they did not ask it sincerely. They did not ask the question uh, really wanting to know the truth. Instead, they were in an insincere way asking this question. They were being hypocritical. Uh, it's sort of like when in the abortion debate, when people say, well, what about, uh, what about abortions for rape and incest? Okay, they start with that. And, and I, I like, I heard one uh, a political pundit recently, he's a good, good conservative man, he said this. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll answer your question, but can we first start with this principle that all the other abortions are wrong? Can we first start with that principle? And they just kind of stood there with their mouth open and said, uh, he said, can we start with that? Can we start with the fact that all the others then are wrong? And they said, no, we don't think those are wrong either. He said, that's right. You're not asking me a sincere question. You don't really want to know an answer to this question. You're trying to prove a point. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. They weren't really wanting to know by whose authority do you do these things. Instead, they were trying to prove a point. And, and that's proven throughout the next two chapters. They're trying to make Jesus 
look bad. And so when they come and say, by what authority doest thou these things? That question is a legitimate question, but they're not asking it because they really want to know if there's some authority higher than them. In their minds, they're thinking, we are the authority. Uh, you have no right to supersede us. That's what they're thinking. So they said, by what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it from heaven or of men? And they reasoned within the, with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? Uh, look at, keep your finger here, please turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. He said, The baptism of John, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? Look at Matthew 11, verse 16, that the Pharisees, they didn't believe John when he came preaching, when he came pointing out that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. Look at verse 16. Jesus is describing this generation and these Pharisees, these religious leaders, and he says in verse 16, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? Lord, speak to our hearts as we study this parable. Lord, give us what we need. You know the needs that are in this room today. And I pray that your word will meet those needs. In Jesus' name, amen. He said, Whereunto shall I liken this generation? Is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. We tried joy and happiness, and you didn't respond to that. So we tried sorrow and sadness, and you didn't respond to that. Jesus said, it's the same way this generation is. Verse 18, he said, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath the devil. John came with one of the most disciplined diets you could ever imagine. I mean, imagine he eating a locust and a wild honey. As John preached, he probably had a locust wing in his tooth. I mean, that's how John was. He preached. He, he wore the leather girdle. He, he was a roughneck. He was, uh, he was just extremely disciplined. And that's how John came. He came neither eating nor drinking. He wasn't a hobnobber. He wasn't a, a high society. He probably wouldn't even shake your hand. I mean, he just didn't care about shaking your hand. He just cared about preaching the truth straight and direct. That's who John was. Jesus came the other way. Look at verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. He came spending time with people rubbing elbows, eating meals with them, uh, talking with them, uh, 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 socializing with them. He came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. So they, John, they wouldn't listen to John. They didn't believe John. They wouldn't listen to Jesus. They wouldn't believe Jesus. It was the hardness of their heart. They, were, they just didn't believe him. <coughs> Verse 19, But wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. He said, listen, if the people in Sodom saw the same miracles you folks are seeing, they would have repented. And you still haven't repented. That's what Jesus is saying to these folks. Verse 24, I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. He said, people who spiritually should understand some things, they don't understand these things. And people who we don't think have a spiritual bone in their bodies, they understand these things perfectly clear. Verse 26, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in Thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him, come unto me, all, notice that word, all, Amen. all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Pharisees, yes. Amen. Pharisees too. 
Uh, religious, spiritual people, seemingly spiritual, religious, church-going people, all ye come to me, Jesus said. Amen. Publicans, you mean those cheats, those, scan those, those scoundrels, the people who steal money from their own people? Yes, you come to me. The harlots, you're talking about the street walkers, the openly immoral people? Yes, all. Amen. All. You mean red, yellow, black, white? Jesus said all. Amen. All. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Are you ever, ever sick of the load you're carrying? Then bring it to Jesus, he said. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hey, Nicodemus, you're a spiritual leader. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He said, Lord, he said, Master, we know you must have come from God because no man can do these miracles that thou doest except he be from God. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, I don't understand, Lord. I don't, I don't get that. How am I, how am I going to enter back into my mother's womb? He said, Aren't, you're, a, you're a teacher, you're a master in Israel, you don't know these things. That which is of the flesh is flesh, that which is of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. doesn't matter who you are. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Turn back to Matthew 21. Here are these Pharisees and these scribes, and they're saying, Jesus, what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? He said, okay, first I'm going to ask you a question. Then you, hey, if you answer my question, I'll answer your question. The baptism of John. Look at verse 25, chapter 21, verse 25. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? They didn't believe him. Verse 26, But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. He said, your, your question is insincere. You don't really want to know. You're just trying to make a point. You're trying to, to establish that you are the ultimate authority. But Pharisees, Sadducees, elders, chief priests, you're not the ultimate authority. Amen. God is. Amen. And so now he's going to try to explain that. And he's going to use a parable to do it. Verse 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. I will not. An act of the will. But afterward, he repented. What is repentance? It's a change of mind. It's changing your mind. It's changing the way you think about something. Uh, how, how is uh, repentance part of salvation? It's when you change your mind and you look to yeah, Jesus right. Christ for salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not when you turn over a new leaf, yeah, when you right. start to live a better life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, somebody, let's say somebody's struggling with, with uh, 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 let's pick one, uh, with drinking. Somebody's struggling with drinking. You go to them and say, hey, first give up your bottle, first give up the whiskey, then you come to Jesus Christ. Not at all. That's not yeah, salvation. Right. That's right. 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 And some Amen. people teach that. It's called Lordship Salvation and it's anti-Scripture. Right. It, 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 it's wrong. Uh, what, what you do is you don't go to the doctor when you're better. You go to the doctor to get better. Uh, you, you don't say, well, uh, doctor, I'm, I'm sick and so I need some help. And the doctor says, okay, will you get better and then come back and see me? No, I go to the doctor because I'm sick. Right. You don't go to the dentist with a bad toothache and say, uh, hey, uh, Dennis, my mouth hurts so bad. Please help me. And he says, okay, I'll tell you what. You get better. You go home. Once you're feeling better, once you're healthy, you come back and see me. No. That's why you go to the dentist. Because you don't feel better. Folks, salvation is salvation because we can't save ourselves. That's right. We can't turn our lives around. We, we can't uh, turn over a new leaf. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So repentance is when you change your mind. When you're no Amen. longer depending on your baptism or your church membership or Pharisees, re religious leaders, you know the law. You think you practice the law. You think you're so great. You're so grand. You don't need anything. 
And Jesus said, you need repentance. Right. You need to change your mind. Right. You need to come to Me as your Savior. That's what Jesus is saying. And so He is illustrating this. He says, well, well what do you think? He said, there's two, two sons. A man had two sons. And He said to the first one, go work in My vineyard. And He said, I will not. But He repented. He changed His mind. Right. Verse 29, and went. You know, when you truly get saved, well, again, works don't save you, but when you truly get saved, your life changes. Does that mean you never struggle with sin again? No, the Scripture teaches us you'll battle sin to the day you die. But what it does say is that your desire changes. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. All of a sudden, there's a new man battling the old man inside of you. A lot of people, when they get saved, they'll say, Pastor, my life's harder now than it was before I got saved. That's true. Why is that true? It's true because before you were just asleep in the devil's lap. Before you just gave in to every, everything that your flesh brought, that the world brought, that Satan brought to you. But once you got saved, Christ moved in and a battle began. The Spirit in us lusteth envy. The flesh against the Spirit. The spirit against the flesh. Just like that, uh, uh, the, the, the missionary who led the chief to the Lord. He said, he said, tell me how it is now that you're saved. He said, every day there's a black dog and a white dog inside of me that fight he said, well, which one wins? He said, the one I feed the most. And that's the way it is with the spiritual life. But here's this man. He repented and went. When you repent, when you come to Jesus Christ, your actions will change. And now again, it's not up to you as a Christian or me as a Christian to look at someone else's life and go, well, I don't know. They don't right. quite measure up. I don't think they're really saved. Right. Folks, you, you don't have that discernment. Right. Neither do I. Uh, I've seen Christians who've been saved 20, 30 years. They see somebody who's been saved for six months. Yeah. And they go, well, if they were really saved, they wouldn't wear that. If they were really saved, they wouldn't go there. If they were really saved, they wouldn't do this. Folks, is God still working on you too? That's right. Amen. Yes. He's still working on all of us. Amen. Uh, be careful not to put on your black robe of judgment. Yes. That's right. You don't, have, you, you don't have the right to it. Only God does. Amen. But when you do repent, things will change. When you do come to Jesus Christ as your Savior, something changes. The Holy Spirit of God moves in. Notice, when He went to this first son, He said, Son, go work in my vineyard. What did He say? I will not. But afterward, He repented and went. But notice the next son. The next son was, was very cooperative. In fact, he had a great attitude. In fact, at, at first glance, if you had to say which one of these sons is the obedient son, at first glance, we would say the second son is probably the obedient son. Because what did the second son do? Notice verse 30. He came to the second and said likewise. So he said to his second son, Go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I go, sir. He didn't just say, I go. He said, I go, sir. Boy, he had a great attitude. I'm going to do your will. At first glance, if you just looked at the command, this son who said, I will not go, and this son who said, I go, sir, he said, oh, that's the obedient son right there. That's the good one right there. Now remember, Jesus is trying to illustrate something to the Pharisees. He's trying to illustrate something to the Sadducees, to the chief priests, to the scribes, to the elders of the people. In their minds, they're thinking, boy, we're the, we're the good ones. I mean, God's lucky to have us. We don't just keep the law. Boy, do we ever keep it. I mean, we go to the nth degree to make sure we keep the law. We're the good ones. And Jesus is trying to break down that mindset in their hearts to help them to understand they're sinners too who need a Savior. Notice he says, verse 30, the second son said, I go, sir, and went not. So the first son said, I'm not going to go. But he repented and he went. The second son said, I go, sir. But he didn't go. Verse 31, Jesus now asks a simple question. Whether of them twain, which of the two did the will of his father, which one did the will of his father? The one who said, I'm not going to go, but repented, changed his mind, and he went. 
or the one who said, Yes, sir. I go, sir. But he didn't go. Jesus asked the Pharisees, the scribes, the elders, the chief priests, after they had just asked him, by whose authority do you do these things? He said, which one of those two did the will of his father? Verse 31, they say unto him, the first. Well, the one who first said, I'm not going to go, but repented and went. The one whose mind was changed, he went. He did the will of his father. So he asked the, the leaders, which one did the will of his father? They said, the first. That is what Jesus says. Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Wow. Do you understand how, how uh, incendiary these remarks are? He's saying to the spiritual leaders, the political leaders of the Jews, he said, listen, you think you're hot stuff, but I want you to know something. That harlot who got saved, that harlot who repented, her mind was changed, and now her life is starting to change. She goes into the kingdom of God before you. Huh? Wait a minute, I've spent all my life keeping these rules. Yeah, exactly. But you don't understand you're a sinner who needs a Savior. Hey, you know the publican you hate so bad? You know Bob up on the corner, that guy. You know the one who was a publican again? He was a Jew who worked for the Roman government. He taxed Jewish people, but he charged them more than what they had to pay, and he'd pocket the rest. So if the Roman government said your tax is $100, he'd go, well, it's really $200. There's a, there's a processing fee, and he'd take the 100 People hated the publicans. Hated them. Crooks, liars, cheats, thieves, thieves. Jesus said, you know that publican? He repented. He repented and came to me for salvation. He goes into the kingdom of heaven before you. Now notice it doesn't say instead of you. It says before you. You see, anybody, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 11, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, you Pharisees, you scribes, you chief priests, you elders, you people who think you're getting to heaven because of your good works, because God's just lucky to have you, once you get sick of that, once you realize you're a sinner who needs a Savior, you come to me and I'll save you just like I'll save the heart. Amen. You come to me and I'll save you just like I'll save the public again. Amen. He said, but listen, until that point, these people go into the heaven, kingdom of heaven before you. You know, uh, Jesus said this. He said, uh, how, hardly are they that, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? They said, well, well Jesus, they said, this is, a, this is hard. How can people be saved then? He said, no, what I'm saying is how hardly shall they that trust in riches enter into the kingdom of God. You see, just uh, the, the fact is it doesn't matter who you are. When you're, once you're ready to humble your heart and be saved, Jesus Christ will save you. Amen. I've told you the story of Barry Austin. Who uh, I won't go through the whole story again, but here's a man who, uh, he wasn't ready to hear the gospel. He, he was a businessman. He was a man of money. He was a man of, of, uh, of some means. But it took Lou Gehrig's disease to humble him where he was ready to hear the gospel. Jesus said to these leaders, He said, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Verse 32, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. He preached to you. He preached the same message to you that the publicans heard and that the harlots heard. Same message. Same message. Repentance. <coughs> faith. Repentance toward God. Faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. He preached it. Notice verse 32. And ye believed Him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed Him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe Him. You didn't repent. You didn't believe Him. You didn't believe the message. That's why these people go into the kingdom of God before you. 
Next week we're going to look at the next part of this chapter, another parable that Jesus tells about the nation of Israel itself and how the nation of Israel refused Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, you're Gentile, you're red, you're yellow, you're black, you're white. You were raised in church or you were raised on the street corner. It doesn't matter where you were raised, what your background is. Jesus Christ's blood saves us the same way. Right. Right. And what you have to do is humble your heart and come to Him for salvation. Let's bow our heads together for a moment, please. These spiritual leaders, they said, by whose authority are you doing these things? He said, well, I'll ask you a question. If you answer me, then I'll answer you. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or men? They said, well, we can't say it's from heaven because we didn't believe Him. We can't say it's from men because we fear the people. They said, we can't tell you. He said, then I, I won't tell you by whose authority I do these things. But a certain father had two sons. He went to the first and said, go work in my vineyard. And he said, I won't. But he repented. He changed his mind. And he went. He went to the second son and said, go work in my vineyard. He said, I'll go, sir. And he went not. Which one did the will of his father? The one that went. And he said, the publicans and the harlots, they go into the kingdom of God before you. Folks, the only way to be saved is to humble your heart, to realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and come to Jesus Christ for that salvation. It doesn't matter what your background is. Say, my dad was a preacher. And? Well, I was raised in church. And? Well, I was raised on a street corner. I was raised homeless. And? The fact is, we all need a Savior. Jesus Christ is that Savior. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. In this Sunday school hour, let me ask, is there someone here who say, Pastor, I need Jesus as my Savior? Please pray for me. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Would you just slip your hand up if that's you? I need Jesus as my Savior. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. Who would say, Pastor, there was a day when I humbled my heart and I trusted the Lord Jesus to save my soul and I know I'm headed for heaven because of Him. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Would you give God thanks and praise? 